Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. In 1980, when Cheryl Hazeltine published her book, Central Texas Gardener, she wrote a valuable guide that targeted our region. In her new edition, she updates for current practices. Today, get her powerful insight on how we've changed and why. On tour, let's visit a gardener who dug into the new philosophy. When Michael McNichol built his house and garden for wife Stacy and their son Cash, he pulled from his bank account of innovation, hard work, and sensitivity to resources rather than a ton of money. You don't need a lot of money to make your, you know, your micro environment, you know, something that you enjoy and you don't need to, uh, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on plants even. Um, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie between gardeners. You know, they're always willing to share seeds. Um, and plants. To build his house, Michael also relied on his camaraderie with architect friends Philip Kyle and Spence Kellum. With them as sounding boards, he went to work. My personality is, is when I need something, I try to create it myself. So I bought this vacant lot, built the house um, with my own two hands, and when I was finished, the yard needed to be done. It took him three years to build this energy efficient house using recycled materials when possible. At lunchtime, he visited metal recycling sites for repurposing inspiration. Before Cash was born, he and Stacy lived on site to work on the house after hours. Some of my friends have said this is the best piece of junk I ever bought, and so, <laughs> and it's probably true. But the reason I bought the Airstream was um, uh, I wanted to um, lower my cost while I built the house. People can stay in it if they come visit, and I use it as a mudroom. I have my radio in there, and I'll, on the weekends, I like to spend as much time as possible outside. I'll pop open the door, and the music's coming out, and I'm doing yard work, and, you know, you can get a drink of water. Michael screens it with stylish recycling. In their convivial neighborhood, Michael made the front yard a welcome mat. Stacy rotates seasonal edibles and herbs in a foundling stock tank drilled for drainage. Since the front yard's the sunniest spot, that's where Michael and Cash plant curbside flowers and vegetables. And I'm very local, you know, you use up local stuff, and, and there's nothing more local than your front yard, <laughs> right? Michael used scraps of rebar to discourage cats from scratching up new seeds. With other repurposed vines, he created artistic coffee tables and planters. Philip Kyle was the go-to guy to help Michael with personalized postal service. Other friends created fun things for cash. You know, it's just reuse and recycle and try to make something interesting out of out of junk if you can. I'll just observe someone and go, well, you know, they just built basically a, a box out of steel and I can do that. That was his fearless attitude when it came to the fence on the other side. I had a, a stack of, of leftover steel that I'd used on all the stair rails and the balconies. So I had the steel left over and I didn't want to throw it away and I needed a fence on that side, I felt. And at the same time, a friend of mine was tearing his uh, old dilapidated shed down that had this beautiful rusted um, tin roof. And I was like, what are you gonna do with that? And he's like, well, you can have it if you help me haul it, you know, help me a little bit and haul it off. It just worked for a fence, so it, it creates these nice horizontal lines that I think look real nice. And as the sun comes up, it gets these really nice shades uh, you know, it gets these real nice textures on it, so it was basically a free fence. It just took some time to build, you know, a couple of weekends. He learns as he goes, like with the evolution of the driveway's walkway. Although I'm not that talented, I do have talented friends, and, and, and the friends that I have here in town like to also build, and so we help each other um, think of things to do, and he recommended that that could be a walkway, and at, at one point um, I had flagstone there. I just had rocks there, and then it went to flagstone, and then I decided that it should be 
um, an ePay walkway since I found ePay on Craigslist real cheap. I make a lot of mistakes in retrospect um, because I, I, I don't do this for a living, so um, I approach everything as a problem-solving um, opportunity. Since 2006, when he finished the house, Michael's been figuring out the perfect backyard. In the back, I had just kind of created a uh, open space and I put down um, just a real nice clean layer of uh, decomposed granite. And it looked real clean and nice. And, um, but unfortunately, that material didn't really work for us. And so the guy up the street was putting in um, sod and he got it delivered. And if you get it delivered, you have to buy a whole pallet and he only needed a half a pallet. So he called me and asked me if I wanted it. And of course, me being me, I took my truck down there, loaded it up and just put the sod down rather quickly. And so I created just a little strip and I thought of having circles or squares or, you know, but it just worked out to have a strip of, of lawn back there that I could, I visualized a, you know, me and my kid having a little pitching um, area back there and uh, so I did that and it created a, um, a section about half the width of the of the space that's currently there. Um, eventually I changed my mind and I took that grass out and I planted a, a vegetable garden there and that vegetable garden didn't yield a whole lot for me and it turned out to be a little more work than I was willing to put into it when this little front yard was fine for me. and. Um, so I had all this sill left over, so I just elongated it and got another half pallet and re replanted it. Since fish are fun for a child too, Michael and Stacy turned another stock tank into a child-sized pond. In just a small area, they've created the perfect playground for a small child. There was a tire laying on the side of the road. And if you got a two-year-old and he needs a needs a tire swing, obviously, I think. And so <laughs> what I did was I took the tire part off the rim and I made a tire swing for, for cash. And then I took the steel part and mounted it to a pole so I could wrap the hose around it. So it prevented the tire from going into the landfill. Michael's not finished yet. But as a new gardener, he's discovered lessons from the past while adding new ones of his own. What I realize is as you get older, you don't realize what your parents teach you until much later in a lot of cases. And um, that's how me and my mother would bond is, is I would visit her like if I was away at college or something. The way we spent time was me digging up her plants and moving them because she was sort of like me. Um, I'll plant a a, a plant one day and the next week I, I decide I don't like it there so I dig it up and move it so that's where I got that affliction <laughs> you know so it's just playing with you know it's kind of good right brain and left brain um, activity and the other thing is is now that I do have a kid I do want to kind of instill in him that you know the same thing that my mother instilled in me which is you know get out in the yard get your hands dirty and it's really therapeutic and it's creative. Anyone can do it. It's not, not difficult, it's, it's hard work, but I think it's rewarding. Thanks for sharing your garden with us. And right now we're gonna be joined by a special guest, Cheryl Hazeltine, author of a book that sounds kind of familiar to me, Central Texas Gardener. That's true. Could I say we were first? <laughs> yeah, you were first indeed. Right. 1980. That's right. Well, welcome to Central Texas Gardener, Thank Cheryl you. Hazeltine. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And the book is uh, one that uh, was a pioneering book for Texas gardening in many ways. Uh, and now has been fully updated by Texas A&M University Press. Right. And uh, we're going to be talking about the book itself, um, but I want to start by talking about, lo, those many years ago, uh, what was the inspiration for uh, Central Texas Gardener? Well, shortly after moving here to Texas, uh, incidentally from the Garden State of New Jersey, mm -hmm. I met Joan Filveroff, who was here from Iowa, mm -hmm. and... Uh, 
we began sharing gardening disaster stories <laughs> and, and lamenting the, um, the limited number of resources that were here. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day Joan just said, well, why don't we write a book? Mm -hmm. I think I probably laughed, and, and then we went and we wrote the book. It took us about five years, mm -hmm. but we, in that course, we did turn around from killing plants to growing plants. Mm -hmm. And we took the idea of writing a book to Ted Fisher, who was the county extension agent mm -hmm. at the time, and he was very supportive. And so um, basically, on the basis of our personal experience, Ted's handouts, remember those? Right, yes, Some of them uh, were mimeographed, tips. right? Ted's <laughs> tips. And um, many, many conversations with the staffs of the local nurseries. Mm -hmm. And, and then it came uh, time to, uh, to shop it around. Mm -hmm. And we went to a number of uh, local publishers, and they were very supportive of the project, and they seemed to like it. And, uh, but they all said the very same thing. Central Texas was much too small a market for such a book. <laughs> so that is one of the changes that has right. occurred in those 40 years. And, and we had a mutual friend suggest that we go see uh, Frank Wardlaw from Texas A&M University mm -hmm. Press. And he came over and he liked it. And we thought it was a done deal, but then he said, you have to finish the book before I can uh, absolutely mm -hmm. accept it. And uh, we worked hard on that, and we did it. Joan's daughter, Amy, typed it on erasable bond with two <laughs> onion skin carbon copies. <laughs> I still have the original manuscript. And, uh, this, uh, this is such a different world uh, that we live in, right? But the key thing here is we were not allowed any photographs. Mm -hmm. Not black and white, not color, none. And Joan and I could not... Imagine a gardening book without illustrations. But it was the drawings. Yes, so that's when we commissioned the local artist, Kate Berkwist, mm -hmm. who did the drawings for us. Which were lovely. No, they Indeed. were lovely. I think, I think I included two of them in this edition okay. just out of... The, right. Right. Well, it, 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 uh, you know, it was a terrific book then, and it, and, and it has now been fully updated. And, of course, growing on the, all the different changes, you know, 1980, it was a different world. Now, I started doing a radio program, a garden radio program in Austin in 1983, and I remember all the questions back then were from little blue-haired ladies asking about their dying azaleas. That was the gardening world of Austin in, 19, in the early 1980s, it seemed like. Yes, it's true, and, and also the... Uh Home landscape was a typical spec house had maybe was given one or two Arizona ashes, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, five or six. Which are dead now, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> five or six five gallon broadleaf evergreen shrubs. Pittisborums. Right. And uh, ligustrum. Right. And sod Poodle the front yard. <laughs> sod the front yard with St. Augustine. And, you know, it's amazing how many people lived in those houses right. for 30 or 40 years. With, that, you know, yeah. occasionally a little color with impatience right. or petunias, You're right? But uh, that has all changed. Now. Well, and let's let's start talking about those changes because you know our understanding of what it takes to be successful as gardeners has changed. But I, I think it, that's one part of it. But also, it, it's just a whole different person is gardening now. Really, I mean, we have young people who are very interested in design and the environment and uh, lots of other concerns that are being brought to the backyard that have kind of really f pushed the changes along. Right. Well, the design, I think, has been um, driven by new people coming into Central Texas, mm -hmm. by the explosion of information. We're, we're just subjected to so much information. Mm -hmm. And uh, water conservation. Yeah. We need new plant material. Right. And I actually think also the housing boom was also a major factor. All of a sudden you saw island gardens, curb gardens, mm -hmm. people using their their landscapes for self-expression the mm -hmm. way they did on the interior of the house. Right, right. And now you have even vegetable gardens in the front yard, which... Unheard of. Right, unheard of, and <laughs> probably frowned upon, too, yeah, by, sure. by the neighbors. But, I'm sure there yeah. was, you know, it's like, a, it, 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 you see purple houses now in Austin, <laughs> right. you see vegetable gardens in the front yard. <laughs> exactly, it's, it's wonderful. Yes. I think the whole region looks terrific, in, yeah. including uh, commercial landscapes. I think yeah. a lot of the cities, Very, 
uh, ordinances to encourage mm -hmm. landscaping has mm -hmm. been just wonderful. Well, you know, it, and it starts right from the very basics. We never thought about the soil. Right. You know, back in the 1980s, right. or though you know, we would recommend or were recommended to buy uh, sandy loam, for example. Right. Well, now we know that we were, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot. Right. Or the roots. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, soil uh, science has changed mm -hmm. everything. And as you said, soil was just something where you stuck the plants and then you poured on the NPK. Yeah. And uh, nowadays it's all about feeding the soil. You feed the soil. Soil is a living mm -hmm. uh, organism with, uh, if you feed the soil, the soil will take care of the plants. Right. Provided you uh, select the appropriate plant for the right, area. Right, right. So feeding the soil is one thing that I think has really been a, a certainly a major uh, mind shift for us. Also, just the the plant materials, and you just reference that the appropriate plant materials. Right. You know, I'm, I don't get calls about azaleas anymore. Right. I don't see azaleas in the nurseries anymore. You know, and it's because of this whole attitudinal shift, really, about what's expected and what's appropriate for our gardens. Right, and I think, I have to confess, I still have some azaleas. <laughs> but, I, but I think this summer may, may um, mm -hmm. do them in. They're yes. on their way out for a few years, mm -hmm. and, and I'm no longer babying them. Um, I think, uh, of course, the uh, zero scape plants mm -hmm. were very important, and with them came the agaves and mm -hmm. uh, yuccas and the ornamental grasses, right. and all these new plants also brought great architectural elements to mm -hmm. the uh, landscape scene. Yeah, and, and, and that's they're great. What, uh, that's and I th when I think of Austin gardening now, I, I think of it in two ways. One is this kind of cutting edge. Uh, organic approach, right. uh, water conservation approach, just an environmentally friendly approach. Right. But on the other end, I think of the spectrum of, of these cool, funky designs, all accented by these really striking plants that right. seem to be so popular in our city, like the agaves and the yuccas. Right. Yeah. Our, our previously, our main plants were, as I said, broadleaf evergreens that, you know, they they didn't even provide seasonal mm -hmm. change, and they right. were just there all the time. They were rather constant mm -hmm. and um, the design is much richer and fuller and also I think we we have uh, gardening for wildlife mm -hmm. and that brings uh, whether the gardener is totally aware of it or not a major shift in uh, philosophy and attitude because mm -hmm. once you're planting for birds or butterflies mm -hmm. You're no, no longer interested in a perfectly unchewed leaf. Right. In fact, you go out and you say, oh, what's wrong with my button bush? Nobody is eating it here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and once you get to that point, you're thinking entirely differently yeah. about the appearance of the landscape. Right, right. You know, and it used to be this even and this is it's it's almost classical uh, uh, call in from my old radio show days. It's like, help, I saw a bug in my garden. Right. You know, I you know, call in the army with massive chemical warfare because of uh, one insect sighting. That's true. It, I mean, that's not an didn't matter what kind of insect right, it was. Right. Well, nobody stopped to find out. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know that no no longer is it desirable, but uh, mm -hmm. you don't want to kill every single bug because mm -hmm. that uh, anything that would be left would be resistant to. The chemicals that we have. Right, right. Lots of wisdom that's been accrued mm -hmm. in the book mm -hmm. and, and over these past right. 30 years. I can't believe that when I started out gardening, I was a Chlordane and Dursban uh. <laughs> user. <laughs> and you're still alive to I'm tell I'm still them? alive, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's amazing in and of itself. But and that, now I have but, no. Many of us remember that. Right. You know, and that's what right. we were taught that this is the way to do it, right? Right. right. I, I use no pesticides at the top moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have no need to. No, no, and, and I'm I'm in the same boat. Right. It's a, a, a hearty jet of water is right. a, a pretty effective pesticide right. for most of the things that I deal yeah. with. Well, Cheryl, uh, the book is uh, you know it's been freshly updated with lots of great color images, Thank you. And, and not just uh, uh, line drawings. But, uh, and again, the accumulated wisdom of 30 years. So it, it's a pleasure to have you on. And 
And, and by the way, thanks for sharing Central Texas Gardener with us here at KLRU TV. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It's good to be part of the family. <laughs> well, it, it, an important part of the family and a source of inspiration for many of us back in the 80s. And uh, yes, Central Texas has grown as a market, hasn't it? <laughs> well, thank you again for being a part of uh, the, the gardening scene here and on the program. And coming up next, it's our friend Daphne Richards. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week is what type of mulch is best and how deep should it be around your plant? It's a great question. It's great to replenish your mulch right now because it is so hot out. Just about any organic mulch is a great addition to your soil. It acts as a barrier to evaporation and it acts as an insulator for the temperature of your soil, cooling it in the summer and warming it in the winter. The small aggregate mulch should be used around plants if at all possible rather than the large bark chips and in your garden beds. Two to three inches is a good general rule. Mulch will break down over time and become a part of your soil, so it should be replenished yearly. And again, don't place it directly against your plant and don't make a volcano mound and cover up the trunks of your trees. Rubber mulches do get very hot and are challenging to work around if plants need to be replaced. They do insulate your soil, but they don't break down and add to the good soil structure that you might want. Rock's also a mulch, so it insulates and protects, but it's a permanent on top of soil fixture, and so it also doesn't help with soil structure. Our plant this week is summer snapdragons, Angelonia and Gustafolia. It's a charming little summer annual. It gets only 12 to 18 inches tall and wide. It flowers all summer long, even in our intense heat, so that makes it a great plant for us. The bloom spikes can add an additional 6 to 12 inches to the height, depending on the cultivar. The new Serena series of Angelonia is very heat tolerant and great for Central Texas. The flower colors can be white, pink, purple, and lavender, lots to choose from. Plant this in full sun or very light shade. It's an annual, so it will need to be replaced each year in the spring. It's very drought tolerant, so it won't need much water once it's established. To do in your garden this week, if you want pumpkins for Halloween, it's time to direct sow those seeds into your garden. But watch carefully for the water needs of your seedlings. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org slash ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Steve Kiner for Backyard Basics. Hi, I'm Steve Kiner with Hill Country Water Gardens and Nursery. I'm going to talk to you today about algae in water gardens. There are several types of algae in water gardens, but there's a couple that we can really help keep under control using a couple of uh, different products. The number one um, algae that I always get asked about uh, from my customers is hair algae. It's the long, stringy, fibrous algae. It's also called angel, ha angel hair algae. Um, and it can actually be controlled chemically as well as um, using some things that qu aren't quite as stringent. The number, uh, the thing that are most recommended when controlling hair algae would be these products. These are actual algicides. They contain a little bit of copper sulfate that actually helps kill the hair algae. Uh, you usually treat with them every three days, and after the third treatment, you will actually see the algae whiten and die. The next product that I would actually like to talk about are these two. These are actual oxidizers. Uh, it's a relatively new product. They are granular, they're powders, and you could actually take them, shake them directly onto the hair algae, and you will immediately see this algae start to whiten and die. You will also, what it does is actually makes contact with organic matter that's in the pond, and you will actually see it kind of bubble up. It'll stir your pond up a little bit, but in a day later, it actually clears it out quite well and kills the algae. Then probably uh, the way that I prefer to actually combat algae is to use more of a preventative. And what I mean by that is using something perhaps like barley straw. What barley straw does, it actually creates peroxides as it's decomposing. This particular bale would stay in your pond for about four or five months. As it breaks down and the peroxides are formed, it actually helps prevent the growth of algae, which, you know, if we can get it in a preventive mode instead of actually using chemicals, I think that'd be a great way to go. Another product, this is a very new product that's out and I've had great success with it. What it does is it actually gets to the source of what's causing your algae growth. As it um, 
as you put this product in, it actually has natural bacteria in it that help eat the organic matter that's in your pond. As the organic matter starts to break down and is removed, thus you're also removing the source or the food supply for the algae. The other really common algae that, um, that you're going to have in your pond is, is the green water, the pea soup algae. It can be maintained in several ways, usually with biological filtration, using plenty of plants. We'd like to recommend about 60% coverage of plants in your pond. And then also if it is a little more severe or perhaps you are just a, a true koi pond, uh, ultraviolet light would also help uh, remove those. For Backyard Basics, I'm Steve Kiner. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and check out our blog. Next week, get ready for fall vegetables. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.